China has ambitions to be a tech giant. In this two-part special of Insight, I travel across the country to understand how it is leading in two key areas. Renewable energy. And artificial intelligence. China has a large economy of scale. The user case for AI technology is massive. China aims to be a world leader in AI by 2030, with an industry worth $150 billion. But behind all the ambitious talk, where does Chinese AI really stand? There's already a gap in between open AI and the technology level that's being offered by the Chinese equivalent. And will the rest of the world trust artificial intelligence developed in China? Chinese companies will always have that perception problem that the data they collect will be used for purposes other than purely commercial, even if the truth is something else. I've just arrived in Yichang, Beijing, but my ride today is different. Yes, this taxi is driverless. Today, Beijing is one of 10 cities in China where Baidu's driverless ride-hailing service Apollo Go operates. The company launched the service in August last year, the first of its kind for the country. Okay, we look like we're approaching a traffic junction. I hope the car stops in time. Okay, it stopped. That's quite cool. I'm told that artificial intelligence controls things like which route the car takes, when to start or stop, and how fast it goes. The car is picking up speed and it's going as fast as a normal car. And 40 minutes later, I've reached my destination, Apollo Park, where research and tests on these autonomous vehicles are done. Here, I'm meeting Wang Chong, Chief Brand Officer of Baidu Intelligent Driving Group. It's my first time in the driverless car, mm -hmm. so I was a little bit anxious, but it was very eye-opening. Um, can you tell me how does it work? How does it work? 给您介绍一下，首先您请看这个部分，这是我们这辆车的激光雷达，还有很多的摄像头，这些其实构成了我们这辆自动驾驶车的眼睛，它可以实现比人更广的视野，实现三百六十度的无死角的洞察。那么在
China is expected to operate 12 million autonomous vehicles, which is double that of the U.S. Now, you have mentioned that we have our fifth car, our fifth car. Its cost is 48 million. That is, the price of this car has already dropped below the average price of the industry. Baidu's robo-taxi is an example of how China is all in on AI. After all, the robo-taxi success is achieved in part through state backing. Since 2015, legislation permits and infrastructure support has expanded China's autonomous vehicle industry. It's become part of the country's push for AI advancement to rival the US. In the year of 2016, the then President Barack Obama issued two documents, policy initiative, on promoting artificial intelligence in the US. Swiftly after the US government White House released these two documents on promoting AI, in the year of 2017, the Chinese government issued also one of the first most comprehensive national plan on AI development. And even until these days is the guiding document for China's AI development. It lay out the target, lay out the agenda for Chinese AI development from the year of 2017 all the way until 2030. They wanted to achieve uh, some significant portion of the AI industry in 2025. I think the target was 400 billion yuan. Uh, and then I think they use the phrase global dominance by 2030. And that's both from a, a framework standpoint, so a regulatory standpoint, as well as some portion of investments. And at the time that they put out the master plan, they valued the AI industry at about 1 trillion yen in 2030. AI is considered to be one of the most important transformative technology in the future. And China has a large economy of scale. The user case for AI technology is massive. According to a PwC report, the AI revolution could see China adding 26% or 7 trillion US dollars to its GDP by 2030. AI can support the country's shift to a consumer-oriented economy as well as high-tech driven manufacturing and commerce. Economic benefits, however, are not its only impetus. AI is like a double-edged sword. On one hand, you got, you got the uh, potentially the positive impact to businesses and the society. On the other hand, it will also create perhaps some risks, in particular in security risks. Uh, so by definition, China, as well as any other government who's looking at AI seriously, will have to look at security as part of the whole thing. It's been a key agenda across um, many different countries. So you see EU, you see how much the US is also pushing it. I think that the rhetoric is around having some kind of dominance in AI, not only from an industrial point of view, but also from a, a security point of view. Many uh, countries think that uh, this will give them key advantages in defense, in security, and in new types of industry, and also boost productivity. So I think it's a, a global phenomenon. With the government backing AI, the AI market size is expected to exceed 26 billion US dollars by 2026. The ordinary Chinese also supports the push, being less wary of this burgeoning technology than their US counterparts. A 2021 survey by market research firm Ipsos saw 78% of Chinese people agreeing that the advantages of AI outweigh the drawbacks versus 35% of Americans. And if you look, AI adoption can now be found in many places in China. From the autonomous vehicle I just took to something more mundane, gaming. This startup over in Hangzhou is experimenting with the use of AI to create a virtual detective game. Their online community of 200 members contributes storylines to a GPT or generative pre-trained transformer model, which creates clues for a player when prompted. This is the same technology used in ChatGPT. 
so there's uh, several different parts uh, we utilize the AI. Uh, the first part is we use AI to generate game assets. For example, your clothes, your feeling, your skin, and everything from the environment design, from the game storytelling, and we focus on the community with the storyline. We don't have to like train our own model, but we use fine tuning. It's much more like a teaching AI and like um, using our small data set to let AI know what is something we want. I think it's convenient and far quicker to get a, a very quick re response from the generation. I think it's around two to three months for us to actually uh, launch this game. I think it's super fast. I think it only used one fourth of the previous like traditional time to polish such a game. At the moment though, China lags behind the US in terms of AI advancement. Something made abundantly clear last year when we got a glimpse of the world's most popular AI chatbot. So when OpenAI introduced ChatGDP last October, uh, actually the Chinese were caught by surprise, a lot actually. The Chinese didn't really anticipate uh, OpenAI was able to you know, introduce such a powerful new, t new tool in, the, in such a, uh, a short manner. Uh, but like many other things that Chinese uh, would be doing, the Chinese were quick to react to it, and they would take this on as a challenge. Chinese tech firms have launched their versions of generative chatbots one after another this year, after getting the green light from the government. And I think it's time to get up close with one of them. I'm at Zhongguan Tun, China's Silicon Valley, and I'm here to meet Baidu's generative AI chatbot, also known as ErnieBot. Let's see what it can do or say. I'm going to ask Ernie about what it feels about ChatGPT. Ernie just answered in Chinese. I'm going to ask it to translate for me into English. OK, Ernie believes ChatGPT is a very promising model and development will bring convenience and innovation to humans. Hmm, let's see. What makes you different from other chatbots? It says many differences. It can conduct self-optimization and improvement based on feedback and the gathering of more data. Although the answers it gave seems to be very similar to what other chatbots can do. Now I'm going to ask Ernie, why is China investing so heavily in AI? So Ernie says that China is investing heavily in AI for economic development, it's also for social needs, as well as it's part of a national strategic status. What social needs could AI address? For that, we'll have to make a trip to Hong Kong next. China's population is aging fast. By 2035, there will be 400 million people aged 60 and over in the country, almost double the number in 2019. As the elderly will soon make up a third of the population, the demand for health services is expected to rise. Will there be enough doctors to cope with the country's needs? Let's ask Ernibot. So, according to Ernibot, the country has 1.4 billion people and 4.3 million doctors. That works out to about three doctors per 1,000 people, just above the minimum number of 2.5 doctors per 1,000 people recommended by the World Health Organization. Adding to the problem, medical resources are not evenly distributed between urban and rural areas. AI could be the answer. Over in Hong Kong, one startup has created an AI-based health and wellness monitoring software. 
其實呢個咧係我哋公司新推出嘅一個誒 AI 嘅技術啦。其實咧就係可以有個心臟嘅體驗啦。咁譬如可能睇到你嘅血壓、你嘅即係血氧情況啦。咁另一個咧就睇下個呼吸。Our technology, called Vitals, is basically a software-based technology that makes use of the regular camera of your smartphone, your tablet, or your webcam, so your everyday device, from actually selecting these regions of interest of the face, like the cheeks or the forehead, the specific areas that we, we observe the skin to be thinner. Uh, those areas we can actually capture a larger signal specifically the, the physiological signal in the body. So from there, we also move forward to actually apply different signal processing techniques to calculate this physiological signal from the color changes from our skin. And then from there, we, we also have some downstream uh, big data models that are used to calculate the subsequent vital signs, uh, like our blood pressure, like our cardiovascular disease risks, and so on. It's estimated that China has over 150 medical AI companies. And a report by McKinsey expects advancements in AI for healthcare and life sciences to add 25 billion US dollars to China's economy by 2030. And tech like Panopic AIs may benefit rural areas in China, where doctors and medical infrastructure are lacking. With this technology, it can function as an early screening tool, provide more information to your physician, and allow the physician to just provide in general better health care to you. Another application or big application for this technology would be surrounding healthy aging, elderly care, and even all the way to neonatal care. These industries would traditionally require various types of contact-based devices. If we could shrink everything down into an iPad or, or a smartphone, then this will actually provide uh, accessible and, and, and scalable health care for the, 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 the general population as well. This way, AI could extend services to underserved communities. In terms of inequality, AI hasn't really made an impact yet, um, but uh, we can see some of the potentials. There is a lack of access to high-quality medical care in the least developed regions in China. And some of the treatment can be given online as well. One area has the most promise, and that is in education for the least developed region in China. Uh, many areas in central and western China has been having this problem of not being able to attract enough teachers, enough good teachers to come to uh, the villages or the counties. While China's urban population has surpassed its rural, the rural-urban education gap is widening. AI might just level that playing field. Since the double reduction policy was announced in 2021 to reduce students' academic burden, private tuition centers were forced to shut down. Squirrel AI, an education technology company, was one of them. Prior to 2021, their learning centers had teachers around to assist students if they faced difficulty answering a question on the AI-powered learning system. Now, teachers are no longer in sight at their centers. Instead, it is AI virtual assistants who identify their learning gaps and teach them how to solve a problem. The knife is very dangerous. Knife. Usually when a student starts with school AI, we give tests to them. But uh, the test is uh, based on AI. So when we give a, a very thorough diagnostic for each student, we can understand what scene, what content, what knowledge point they need. Uh, this is a school AI learning tablet. After the student have tested, and we could give a knowledge map like this. Uh, the green part means this knowledge the student already understand, but the red part means the student's loophole. 
by gradually understanding of the student, we give different learning content. For example, teachers uh, teaching videos to see if the student could understand and then give them exercises to train them. So we can like 10 times uh, make the education more efficient. Before that, my, my, my English score is only 50% to 60% and sometimes I even fail the exam. But after I use this system to study, I have improved my English score to, to 90%. Because the system knows me a lot and, and, and I can save my time. After two years, the company has sold over 200,000 tablets in China's big cities. But most students in China actually live in rural areas. We have students from the tier one, tier two city to very remote area. At that area, the teaching quality is really poor. It's uh, hard to believe. So the students, they need a good you know, device that can help their kids to really learn and understand what they need to learn. So in the past years, we have uh, helped more than 10 million poor students to give them free school AI account to let them have the best teaching quality. So AI could be a way for the government to address structural problems, from inequality to an aging population to resource security. China has the world's second largest population. Food security has been one of the key concerns for Beijing. A growing appetite mixed with decreasing arable land and farm workers mean China increasingly relies on food imports. Meanwhile, climate change is impacting yields. Intelligent agriculture is one of the areas highlighted in the 2017 National AI Development Plan along with intelligent medicine, intelligent cities, and intelligent manufacturing. But there are some ways to go in some of these areas. I don't think AI is that important yet uh, when it comes to the improvement of day-to-day -day life in food security. China is still more reliant on the traditional technology in terms of irrigation, uh, improvement of the seed technology. And for the industrial sector, the AI use is wider, but still I wouldn't say the latest technology of AI has been that important for the industrial transition. Most of the technologies used in Chinese industries are still more related with automation to use machines uh, to replace labor. For now, AI is still a nascent technology in China. However, the country is one of the fastest when it comes to tech adoption, as we've seen in things like mobile payments, virtual reality, and electric vehicles. Could the same acceleration happen with AI? Just wander around China and you can see how widespread digital payments are. Today, about 8 in 10 Chinese adults use digital payments. The Fletcher School at Tufts University developed a digital intelligence index. It measures a country's digital advancement on the y-axis and pace of digitalization on the x-axis. And China is here. This means that while Chinese tech is not the most advanced, it has, by far, the fastest rate of digitalization. In the past decades, we have embraced and benefited greatly from the advancement of information and communication technology. And AI innovation is one of the tech breakthroughs that we believe will bring great advantage and benefits to the society. AI adoption is expected to be equally quick. For example, 
China now leads the world in AI patents. But new technology is disruptive. According to a prediction by Goldman Sachs, artificial intelligence is expected to replace 300 million jobs worldwide. For China, one in five existing jobs could be cut in the next 20 years, based on a report by PwC. With youth unemployment reaching a record high of over 20% earlier in the year, this is a touchy subject. Let's ask Ernie what was the top grossing Chinese movie in 2019. Ernie says, The Wandering Earth. Released before the pandemic, this film heavily involved the use of computer-generated imagery, or CGI. If Wandering Earth was made today, perhaps it could be done by artificial intelligence. This short film was produced last year by production company Versatile Media. It was awarded Best Visual Effects for Narrative Short Film at the 14th Spark Animation Festival. AI is actually understood as in many of our the AI 来保持，因为它有一个呃实时渲染的场景，如何跟相机的角度位置能够快速的去匹配。那这种其实它有个预知作用嘛，就是你怎么才能预测你未来的相机的运动。那么这个部分其实它它需要有一个算法。另一个就
there will be new demands on new jobs that will be created because of AI. But there will also be older jobs that will be replaced because AI become prevalent. And then there is the issue of data. Data is essential to train artificial intelligence, like the one behind Squirrel AI's educational platform. This data, uh, for example, like, like different uh, questions and uh, the different tag of the questions and uh, uh, how fast they finish the question and how fast they learn the knowledge point from zero to fully mastered uh, and even their facial expression and all of these things we use all these data to understand the student much more than their teachers who have taught them for years. So if we give them something too difficult it's uh, out of their ability range. We, we can see in their face, they are getting nowhere. So we could adjust uh, our model uh, to be more suitable for him. And also sometimes the, the student could get bored. Maybe he need um, uh, some rest or maybe change the scenario and uh, make him feel fresh. Three years ago, the firm won EdTech Review's Best AI Education Company Award. Now, it wants to look beyond China's shores. We want to expand to the US market and also the uh, South Asia market. So, we may go out of China like uh, one year uh, ahead, and we need one year to build our uh, content for the international market. But 80% uh, of our system are actually the same. We just change the content in English. But not all countries are so ready to hand data over to Chinese companies. One recent example is TikTok, the popular social media platform with a billion global active users each month. Its parent company, ByteDance was accused of storing U.S. users' personal data in China and allowing Chinese authorities access to them. If the CCP tells ByteDance to turn over all data that TikTok has collected inside the U.S., even within Project Texas, do they have to do so, according to the Chinese law? Congressman, first I'm... In the context of China, uh, there is a great fear, uh, justifiable or not, that those data coming from for example, Europe or the US, back to, to China, will cause potential government surveillance by the Chinese government. The fear of Chinese private companies collecting data overseas, uh, to my observation, is largely exaggerated. We see certain companies setting up independent entity overseas, which is under the leadership of local uh, teams, which follows local law and regulations. I feel that it's very difficult to separate the politics uh, from what is going around from a, a data governance or data uh, privacy kind of conversation. Um, and Chinese companies will always have that perception problem that you know the data they collect will be used for purposes other than purely commercial or maybe used for purposes that are don't fit either the EU or the US frameworks, even if the truth is something else. And this cuts both ways. China is also concerned that data of Chinese citizens are shared outside its borders. And so, it enacted a number of data security laws in 2021. Companies which process cross-border data transfers of a million or more individuals' personal information must now undergo a strict security assessment. This move may further impede Chinese companies' expansion efforts. China's regulatory framework now only uh, allows Chinese users' data to be used in China. Um, that might uh, hamper Chinese companies going abroad. Um, and it also might include sort of tit-for-tat regulation or tit-for-tat actions by other companies, right, who want access to, to China data. So from an industrial development point of view, that may be one drawback.
So the government has responded with several measures, and some have a quite significant impact. Uh, for example, in terms of the data release, uh, the Beijing government has released a number of data from the state-owned enterprises and the state-affiliated research institute to the industrial sector uh, that's related with AI. So they can use those data freely to develop their model. In the future, I can see that China probably will have to be more clear on what kind of data can be used for industrial purposes and what can be defined as the restricted data. So, China may have ambitions to be the global leader in AI by 2030. But outside its borders, is there a market for Chinese AI products? I've been traveling across China to find out about the country's developments in AI. In July this year, Beijing published a set of interim rules for generative AI. It is the first country to do so. The regulations aim to promote the healthy development and regulated application of this technology. What this translates to are censorship and control. According to the most recent regulation of generative AI, content generated by generative AI need to reflect the so-called socialist value. Meanwhile, it need to be moderated if it's generating any content which is politically sensitive or politically controversial. Chinese government is more worried about this technology getting out of control because in contrast to machine learning, the generative AI has this innovative ability to have a different answer to the same question. If you ask the same question to a generative AI, it basically will give you a different answer based on the data set it can access. And so far, we have seen, of course, more capital flowing into the AI research and development, but quite limited in the generative AI-related technology comparing to the machine learning. The Chinese internet has been called one of the world's most censored by the MIT Review. These same curbs will likely apply to AI datasets. They might not want a, a tool that allows for a lot of different types of information when it comes to politics or elections that is out there. And you can see from Ernie, right, if you ask Ernie certain questions about politics, it tends to be rather quiet. And so you may question how viable that may be in terms of exporting that type of generative AI software abroad, right, where it may not be as good as some of its other competitors uh, because of being quiet on certain issues. One month after the regulations were released, Chinese rivals to ChatGPT were made available to the public. Baidu's Ernie Bot user base has since reached 70 million, not far behind ChatGPT's 100 million weekly active users worldwide. Anybot has been useful on my journey so far, but if I compare it to ChatGPT, it's not as robust or as refined. The OpenAI people have a head start on this. And, you know, this whole learning process, as you know, is all learned by algorithms, right? The learning process is a multiplicative process. And so once you have a head start, it's very difficult in a way for the latecomers to catch catch up with you. So there's already a gap in between the technology level that is being offered by OpenAI and the technology level that's being offered by the Chinese equivalents. And there is one more advantage that ChatGPT has over its Chinese competitors. One major constraint is the lack of data. 
And that's quite counterintuitive because China has tremendous amount of data and a lack of protection, really, for uh, when it comes to the privacy of consumers. Um, but most of the global websites are written in English, not Chinese. Only about 1.5% of the global websites are written in Chinese. So that has created this uh, dilemma for the local companies. If they train their AI model with English, then there's a very little user case in the Chinese contest. But for Chinese internet users, they usually generate content or interact with the internet through super app on their phones. And those super apps uh, like WeChat or Weibo, they have uh, walls, we call them a walled garden. And that has created additional barriers for those AI models to pick up on the data uh, in either the mobile environment or from the internet. And that's a fundamental flaw. There are also structural problems that Chinese AI firms have to address. Last year, the US announced a ban on the sale of supercomputing chips and advanced chip-making equipment to China. AI-specific chips like the NVIDIA H800 and A800 were recently added to the ban list. These chips were specifically designed for the Chinese markets. The Biden administration also issued an order to restrict US investments into China. I think that most of the, the concerns comes with uh, the application of AI to, to military and defense. Uh, and that has always been a concern with, uh, with technology. Um, and, and, and that will remain as long as these two powers are sort of uh, in some sort of rivalry. In July, FBI director Christopher Wray warned that cyber attacks by Chinese AI will present an unparalleled threat to the US. For both the Chinese and the US government, they believe that there are only a handful of technologies that are important for the next 20 years. For China, AI technology and the chips are the two top choice for the Chinese government. Since most of the AI companies in China rely on foreign suppliers uh, like TSMC, or uh, the industrial designers, uh, the chip designers like NVIDIA. The restrictions on their design chips has become a major constraint for the future development for Chinese AI. The China-US relation is probably not going to improve significantly in the coming decade. So China now focus or stress very heavily on the self-reliance of high tech. I think that what it means from a practical standpoint is that China's AI developments comes at more cost. So it might have to use uh, different types of chips or more of them or, or pay over the odds uh, to get that type of technological uh, advancement. So it increases the cost for China. While hardware has been grabbing the headlines, there is also another layer to the AI wars the talent pipeline. China now produce, for example, about 1.4 million engineers every single year. Uh, and that is about four times as much as that in the US. Many of those talents uh, in the AI industry would study abroad, uh, mostly in the US, and work a few years for tech giants like Google or Amazon, and then come back to China. But now this channel is mostly cut. Uh, many of those talents, if they want to work for both sides, it has practically become impossible. Last October, the U.S. prohibited green card holders and foreign nationals who live in the U.S. to support China with technology in producing advanced computing chips. And for Chinese local universities, the technological know-how in the industry is quite lagging. Uh, we do need more collaboration or more of a coming back of foreign talents or foreign professors in the relevant field to come to China. And then we can have this kind of technological infusion throughout the industry. But now um, that road seems to be closed, more or less. These are hurdles for China in the race for AI supremacy. 
But there's one thing that could allow the industry to catch up, the full weight of the government behind it. We do see that in the US there is this bottom-up approach towards AI innovation and in general technology a breakthrough. But in China, this scenario is quite different. In a sense that, as we know, the Chinese society, Chinese economy is very much government-led. AI will receive the most attention and some of the most important fundings from the state. So I have no doubt that China will catch up in many areas uh, in the context of AI competition. And eventually the two countries will be quite similar in their computational model um, when it comes to the use of AI. I can't say for sure that China is already at the top of the world in AI, but China is certainly at least one of the leaders is within the pack that's leading the world. So it's, that is already pretty clear. In my journey across China, I was surprised by how commonplace AI had become. Everyone wants in on the action. From the classrooms, to clinics, to cinemas. The biggest challenge, it seems, lays outside its borders. From trust to tech, Beijing will have to convince the world of its AI viability if it wants to be a global leader by 2030.